Bless the Lord. Yes. Someone said, oh, my soul. Yes. And forget not all of his benefits. When I talk to my mom on the phone every now and then, she is uh, 85, soon to be 86. And she'll say, Lauren, I was watching SBN and I saw my grandkids. And all I could say was, bless the Lord. Yes. Oh, my soul. And all that is in me. Amen. 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 All right. Are you ready to hear some Bible tonight? Amen. Yeah. Hey, let's go for a few minutes to 1 Kings chapter 18. And uh, forgive me for prolonging this. I probably went a little bit long with the music, but man, that's good music. Yeah. Yeah. And it'll, it'll get down into your heart and keep you strong tomorrow. 1 Kings chapter 18, and I promise not to preach a forever message or a, what, what, what was it that Bob Cornell said? A Pharaoh message. You know what a Pharaoh message is? It's a message that just won't let you go. <laughs> we won't wear the saints out, but we want to get a few things across uh, to you. First Kings, Old Testament, chapter 18. Uh, I do not have time to read the whole chapter when you get home tonight. It would do you well to do so. And to put some of these things back into your mind that we won't have time to cover tonight. But we will take our text, 1 Kings 18, verse 30, through the first portion of 32. 30 through 32. A well-known story, but don't let me lose you, because there's some new truth that needs to be established here. And Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord, that was broken down. I want you to see it. He repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob unto whom the word of the Lord came saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. I'm going to give my message tonight two titles, which is highly unusual for me. I don't think I've ever done that. But it's this, first of all, the value of the cross. The church today has lost sight of the value of the cross. We don't really understand its worth. We really don't understand what the word means. Sometimes we just think it's the wooden beam that Jesus hung on and died. But whenever we really say cross, or whenever a ministry or a minister such as SBN, Jimmy Swagger Ministries, Crossway Ministries Church, says the cross, what they're really talking about is what Jesus Christ accomplished on the tree of Calvary, on the cross of Calvary, all emblazed, all of it embedded in that one act, the cross. And we've lost the value of the cross. Now, my second portion of this title may not be clear now, but I hope to make it clear by the time we finish. And it's this, when it rains, yeah. it pours. When it rains, it pours. Because if we'll come to know and trust and rely, Lord God, on the cross of Jesus Christ, God is going to pour out. I said God will pour out. I said God will pour out. And many times we look at this statement when it rains, it pours as a negative one because it never seems to fail. The enemy just hits us from every angle all at once. But when God starts to bless, yes. <laughs> you're getting it. When God starts to bless the Christian, let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. It might take us a little while to get there, but tonight I hear the sound. I said I hear the sound. An abundance, of, abundance of rain, and when God starts pouring out His Spirit, when it rains, 
it pours. Let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight for the opportunity to teach, preach the value of faith in the cross. And I'm asking for the preacher to come, the teacher to come, the one that makes teaching and preaching easy, the person of the Holy Spirit, and take over the controls, Lord. Guide me, lead me, show me what is needed to be said, what, needed to, what needs to be stated. Father, let me do no violence to your word, and we'll give you all the praise for the edification of your people, and we'll ask it in Jesus' name, amen and amen. I think that even though I've never watched it, I've seen segments of uh, this particular television program where there's people that have items in their home, and maybe it was passed down from uh, the past generation. Maybe it was just something they came across in an antique shop or whatever, and uh, they, they, they've had it in their home, and they think it might be valuable. And so they take it to a guy or a gal or somebody that uh, is able to really evaluate the value of that thing. And they're, they're, they don't know what it's worth. They don't really have any idea, but they're hopeful that that guy's going to tell them, well, you spent $2 too much on that item. They're hopeful that they're going to hear that's worth two hundred thousand dollars. Have you ever seen that? Yes. And it's it's evidence that there's that at times a treasure in someone's house, and they have no idea what it's worth. They have no idea really what it's meant for. They just they have it around. They have it located into their home or they have it in their business or maybe they've gotten tired of it and it's gone up in the attic but one day they pull it down and they take it to this person that's able to evaluate such things and he says that's of great value well I feel the very same way about the cross of Jesus Christ because the church everywhere you go every time you see a church it doesn't matter what name is on it it's got a steeple attached to it a cross attached to it because the cross is the central figure of Christianity but most Christians don't know what they have most Christians don't know the value of the cross they don't know the value of an altar. They don't really understand the role that the cross plays in our everyday life, not just in our salvation experience. Uh, we Christians, if we are Protestants, really, really look at the cross and say, well, I place my faith in Jesus. He paid the penalty for my sin. And that is entirely correct. And we don't lose sight of that. But I've got to tell you that there's far more to the cross of Jesus Christ than just the penalty yes. that was paid there for your sin and mine. If, if, if that was all it was, that would be good enough because that would get us to heaven. Yes. I said that would get us yes. into heaven. Yes. We walk down the streets of gold and you give God praise for it, but that's not all. And if you think that the value of the cross is limited to your entrance into the kingdom of God, then you don't know the value of what you have. Amen. It's easy to lose sight of what we have been given. And Israel had done the very same thing. They had been introduced to God like no other people on the face of the planet. In fact, God raised them up from Abraham, incubated them in Egypt, and then brought them out with a mighty hand and introduced himself to his people at Mount Sinai. They camped there for a year and four months where they built the tabernacle. They learned a little bit about God, something that no people had ever known because God chose Israel to be his witness to the world that he was the one true living God. And so he educates the people. He gives them the law. He gives them uh, orders that, may, that, that, that means that they're separate and distinct from everybody else and different ways of living than anybody else because they are his people. They are his witnesses. And he brings them into the promised land even though there's a 38-year delay that's their fault. Listen, let me tell you something. If there's a delay coming in our lives, it's not God's fault. That's right. I guarantee you, it's you or me being yeah. knuckleheads and stopping what God wants done. Yeah. Or failing to believe what God wants done. And sometimes, God just has a timing. Yeah. Yeah. 
I said, sometimes God just does a timing. Sometimes it's not your fault, and sometimes it's not God's fault. Sometimes it just it just ain't time. And ladies, bad grammar, good preaching. Sometimes it's just not ready. But the Israelites, they miss God. They walk in unbelief, and they fail to be able to enter the promised land as they should have. God only intended them to be a year and a half in the desert, and it was 40 years total. But he finally brings them in. He establishes them under Joshua. He brings them in under the judges, and then establishes David as the king, the sweet psalmist of Israel, ultimately becomes the first king of Israel. It's worth anything. But shortly after, in the reign of Solomon's son, David's son, there was a split. The northern kingdom and the southern kingdom were established, and immediately the northern kingdom, fearful that they would lose their power, the leaders, established idolatry. In the time of the judges, the altar was the place where sacrifices were given. But when the temple was built under the hand of Solomon, all of the altars in the country were no longer valid. God said you were not to use them. There was only one place that you were to sacrifice. And that's important, ladies and gentlemen, because God only has a sacrifice in one place. It's not any hill that can handle the altar of God. There was one hill, the hill of Calvary. Yes. And so he told his people after the time of the judges and in the time of the temple, before the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom split, that there was only one place that that altar could exist, only one place to offer up sacrifices. And when the northern kingdom began to disobey God and move away from the things of God and the things of the temple and turned to idolatry, some of them found those old altars that were erected in the time of the judges where they were still valid and they would tear them down and in their places they would offer up uh, 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 idols and offer up uh, altars and build altars to idols and altars to Baal and the sinful condition I won't do, we're in mixed company, I won't have the time to go into tonight. But it's this atmosphere that spawns the birth and the ministry of a man known as Elijah. He comes onto the scene with just very little of us knowing what he's all about. But we know he's a man of God. And he stands up and he sees the northern kingdom in idolatry. He sees the altars that were once the altar of the Lord torn down. And he makes a decree. And he says, it's not going to rain until I say so. Ladies and gentlemen, that's power. Yes. But he wasn't speaking it from himself. He was speaking it as a representative of God. He was saying, it's not going to rain until I say so. And you know the story, your Bible students, I'm sure. For three and a half years, no rain. Well, when there's no rain, there's no crops. When there's no rain, famine comes. When there's no rain, things can't survive. People aren't able to carry out their everyday living. You can go a little while without food, as long as it's not longer than four hours. <laughs> but you can't go long without water. And a drought begins to appear. Let me tell you something. You need to understand this. Drought and famine have always been God's way of dealing with a people and a land that reject Him. The Bible says that when we begin to carry on talking of the people of God as the those that were idol worshippers, those that carried on in sinful condition before us, it says the land itself will cast us out. What does that mean? It means that place that you live in will no longer become inhabitable. It'll no longer support you. It'll no longer aid you. Drought and famine will always follow spiritual declension. America better take a close look at what's happening in its physical land. 
and realize that the hand of God is on us, yes. bringing drought and famine. Yes. Because of spiritual declension, we've raised up altars, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. And we worship something other than Jehovah. Yes. We worship something other than Christ. We've raised up everything but what God wants raised up. And America is suffering. Elijah makes the decree. And he says it's not going to rain. And after two, maybe two and a half, nearly three years, he comes back on the scene. But he's ready to have a confrontation. And you know the scene in Mount Carmel. He comes and says to the people, he says, Hey, how long are you going to hold between two opinions? If, if, if Jehovah is God, serve him. And if Baal is God, we'll serve him. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you something. How long are you going to halt between two opinions? Are you going to believe in the foolishness that the church has resurrected as an idol, as a way, as a means of life? Or are you going to come back to the simplicity of Jesus Christ and what he did for your God? Are you going to walk in the modern fads of psychology and self-help? Or are you going to move towards something that God's Spirit can move in, that God's Spirit can touch you in? It's time, ladies and gentlemen, to move away. And those of us hiding in different denominations and fellowships, thinking they're going to come back, they're not coming back. They're already too far gone until they understand what Christ did for us in Calvary. And I'm telling you, I'm not trying to berate your church, but denominations have rejected the cross of Christ, hence they've rejected God. And they will not survive or produce a people that are spiritual. They will produce a people of apostasy. They will not produce a people that are spiritual. And it doesn't mean there's not good people in them, people that love the Lord. But you better take heed to yourselves. Famine and drought, famine and drought, famine and drought. How long do we hold between two opinions? The writing's on the wall. Take a look at your own life. There's no spirituality. There's no strength. There's no grace. You're wondering, am I going to make it? Sin is having dominion. Sin is taking over. Sin is rampant in the church. We can't stop it because we're not approaching relationship as God's people, God's way. Drought and famine, drought and famine. How long are we going to halt? Between two opinions. So that... Godwin was thrown down and Elijah looks at the prophets of Baal in that day and he says, you call on the name of your gods and I'll call on the name of the Lord God and the one that answers by fire. Yes. Yes. Woo. Let him be God. I'm, 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 I'm skipping a lot of stuff tonight because it's, so I'm assuming you know what I'm talking about. And an altar that was offered up to a foreign god, that god, when he was pleased with the sacrifice, would send fire from heaven. But the prophets of Baal would build a tunnel underneath the sacrifice. And a priest would crawl up underneath there and start the fire. And it would appear as if the fire started all by itself. Like the God that they were worshiping was real. Well, on this day, they think the tunnel collapsed. Because Elijah said, you go first. And they put that bullock on their altar made to Baal and they worshiped and jumped and cut themselves and hipped and hollered all day long. In fact, Elijah was so amused by it, he said, well, your God's probably on vacation. <laughs> One translator said, what it really means in the Hebrew is that your God's probably in the outhouse. He can't hear you. Shout a little louder. <laughs> but he didn't answer. And then Elijah said this in verse 30, which is our text. He said to the people, come near to me. There's a call going out to the body of Christ today. And men and women who know where to take you are saying, come near 
and join with me. Come near, I want you to see something. The messengers of the cross are doing that now around this world. We are few in number, but we will continue to grow. And our God is with us. And he does miracles. And he does the supernatural. Most of all, he's changing the lives of those who will come to him. But there's a call going out across the church world. You're going to hear it. It's going to be different than anything you've heard before. And it's going to be come near. Come nigh unto me. Crossway Ministry Church in Patterson, Louisiana is saying come nigh unto me. And they're not calling you to themselves. They want to show you something. They've got something to show you. I said they've got something to show you. And listen, you, you've, been, you've been missing it with the other group. There's not anything happening for you. You're in your religion. And you're easing your conscience, but there's no spiritual life. When you first got saved and God transformed your life, ladies and gentlemen, there was a supernatural flow of God and life was good and everything was different. But now it's just same old, same old. Now you can't wait for the preacher to shut up so you can get off. Used to be you couldn't wait to go to church. The glory isn't rolling over in your soul like it once did. The desire for God isn't there like it once was. If that's you tonight, come nigh unto me. I've got a message for you. And don't mistake that statement. Elijah wasn't bringing them to himself. He said this, come near unto me. And then people came near unto him. And it says this, and he repaired the altar of the Lord. It's time. Ministers of the gospel. That we got rid of all of our foolishness, all of our fads, all of our psychology, all of our games, all of our self-help. And we just go back to the simplicity that is in Christ Jesus. For hundreds of years from the time of the judges, those altars that were once legitimate before the temple was built were standing in ruins and suddenly there comes a man that says let's build again the old altars of the Lord let's find the old path let's find the true way of God because right now all I've got is drought and famine it ain't helping it ain't working I'm dying in here. I'm dying spiritually. My children are dying. My church is dying. My city is dying. My country is dying. Amen. I need something more. I've got to have something other. It's time to repair the altar. The altar is a type of the cross. It's time to bring the cross from the central back into our lives again. It's time to come back to the event that established man having a relationship with God. Prophesied in Genesis 3 when God had to first of all take that family, that old so sad family that failed of Adam and Eve and say, I've got to eliminate you. I've got to move you out of here. But listen, don't worry about it. I've got your back. In just a little bit of time, I'm going to bring someone through the seed of a woman. Keep your eyes open. I'm bringing you some help. Help is on the way. Help is coming. I've got to eliminate you from my presence. But I promise. Listen, this is God. Not Donald Trump. This is God saying, I promise I'm going to fix this. I promise I'm going to fix this. And the truth is, before the foundation of the world, he already had a plan. In the garden, he said, look for the seed of a woman. Look for the seed of a woman. Genesis 3.15. Genesis 3.21. The Bible says that Adam and Eve were covered with the coats of skins of animals. And it's here where we believe the first sacrifices were offered up. And so God's redemption plan, God's plan for men to come back into relationship for him was established back in Genesis 3. And it was all about a redeemer and a sacrifice. A redeemer and a sacrifice. Go think a little bit. The 
This plan is not a new plan. This word is not a new word. This is not a new revelation that no one's ever heard before. This is God's plan from before the foundation of the world. And it's time we take a trowel in our hand and the Bible in the other and repair the altar and start preaching the cross and start preaching the truth and start preaching what God's people need to hear. Rebuke us for our foolishness. Forgive us for our idolatry. Let us cast our eyes and our hearts once again upon Jesus. Upon Jesus. Upon Jesus. He began to repair this altar, a type of the cross that was broken down. The Bible says in verse 31, And Elijah took 12 stones. Why 12 stones? Because 12 stones was the entire picture of all of the children of Israel. I had a man look at me one day after I explained to him the message of the cross, and he said, well, that's good for those who need it. That's good for those who need it. No, my friend, 12 stones. Every tribe. Every person. See, he's in the northern kingdom. They don't even recognize. See, the church doesn't even recognize the true body of Christ. Let me tell you something. Every person who's ever said yes to Jesus. Yes. Yes. I'm going to hurt some of you Protestants. There may be a Catholic or two that's a whole lot more born again than some people we got in our Protestant churches. But if they've really placed their faith in Jesus, if they've seen themselves as a sinner all around, I'm talking 12 stones. I said I'm talking 12 stones. I'm talking 12 stones. The body of Christ is bigger than we know and it's smaller than we wish it was. It's bigger than what we really know, but it's smaller because then when we compare it to what actually exists, tomorrow morning all around the nation, there will be church after church opened up with hundreds of thousands of people traveling in that don't give a hoot about Jesus and aren't born again. They're simply easing their conscience and doing their religious thing. Some of you can testify back in your Catholicism days. Man, 5.30 Saturday night, you were out of there. Ready to go do what you wanted to do now because you had your wafer and your little bit of juice and you were good to go for another week. And I don't mean to be crude or rude or crude or... But I do mean to be a little rude. You can break bread and drink religious cups all day long and it won't save you. You can place your faith in the Pope, you can place your faith in your in your in your overseer, you can place your faith in another man, it won't do anything for you. But when you place your faith in you Son of God. He's good for twelve stones. All the tribes. Every church. Every denomination. I said every church. Every denomination. The Baptists are coming back to the cross. The Pentecostals are coming back to the cross. Because the altars are going to be rebuilt by men who won't be bent by religion who won't bow the knee to the pull of aggrandizement and finances. They don't care what anybody else thinks. They've got backbone. Their face is set like a flag, and they're ready to repair the altar of the Lord so that the people can see God move in their lives. And it's for all of us. It's not just for JSM. Not just for Crossway Ministries, 12 stones, I can't get past it, 12 stones. This message is for the whole 12 stones. For all, bring it from the north, bring it from the south, bring it from the east, bring it from the west. 12 stones, 12 stones, 12 stones. Bring it from Judah, bring it from Levi, bring it from Syria. This is not a fad. This is 
God. Thank you. You know the story. Elijah builds the altar, puts the bullock on the altar, drenches it with water, and stands back and says, God, your God, show them. And the fire falls. I from heaven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And somebody has to eat the pile of dry wood with a big light of fire. Let me allow dead preachers 
tomorrow, we start doing that. And I'm saying it. But you destroy them when you stop supporting. You destroy them when you take you and their, your family out of that church that's not preaching the cross. Why are you there supporting something that's building a false altar? Why would you do that? Why would you do it to yourselves? Why would you do it to your community? Well, I've been there all my life. Well, then it's time for a change. If I stop preaching the gospel, don't listen to Lauren Larson anymore. And Paul said it this way, if, if I or any other angel or another man preach any other gospel other than what I've already preached to you, let me be encouraged. Stop listening to Brother Matt if he leaves the message of the cross. Don't turn on SBN if we ever stop preaching the message of the cross. Don't listen to Jimmy Swiger if you have, he ever stops preaching the message of the cross. That's right. That's right. Because it is the very centerpiece of how God was able to come into relationship with us. And now, with our vision on the altar, on the cross of Christ, we say, forgive us. And God says this, that through faith, yes. through faith, yes. being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Doesn't see anything. 
but he sends his servant down to look over where clouds might form. See anything yet? Nothing yet. Number two, oh God, send him. Oh Jesus, send him. <laughs> What are you laughing about? I hear the sound. I may not see it yet, but I hear the sound. I hear it. Second time. Go look. Nothing yet. Oh, Jesus. See, some of you, well, you give up after two times. They told you if you have to ask God for something more than once, then you're not operating in faith. Faith never stops asking. Faith never stops praying. Come back. Come. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. 
sites are going to drop off. Yes. That drug addiction is going to drop off. Self-aggrandizement, pride, and arrogance will begin slow. <laughs> How do I know? I'm just like you. I need the rain. I need the rain. I need the rain. I need the rain. But just like no, it's not just like. Because the devil hits you with everything he possibly could hit you with. But no matter how bad he hits you, or how frequently he hits you, or how devastating the issue, if, if you still believe in Christ and what he's done for you, the rain, the water, the moving of the Holy Spirit will bring you all the way through. And when your faith is tried like Job, you'll stand before God. Pure, righteous, you'll pour so much on you, you won't know what to do. I would that you be in health and prosper. Qualify even as your soul prospers. When your faith is in the altar and the rain is pouring out, and freedom from sin is coming and health overcoming infirmities is there and the power of God is available to you on an everyday basis. Your soul is prospering. Seek ye first yes. the kingdom. Yes. Then all these things See, the cross is your means to all of your inheritance. The cross is the means by which you get freedom from sin. Freedom from the sin and the weight that does so easily beset you. The cross of Jesus Christ is what releases the power of the Holy Spirit. It's what gives us baptism into Christ, baptism of the Holy Spirit. You know, I need three weeks to tell you the value of the cross. God only asks one thing of you and I. We don't have to understand it. We just have to believe it. Yes, yes. And when the preachers stand with you, when the preachers begin to preach the cross, and on the inside of you, on the inside of you, something begins to bear witness.
Jesus. 